thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Gardening is never out of season. Between the planning and the planting and the weeding and the watering, there is always something going on in the garden. Author Carrie Ann Mendez has compiled 70 top 10 lists of design tips and smart plant picks. She sat down with UVM Extension's Leonard Perry to talk top 10s. Here in Extension, we're lucky to have many authors uh, that we can take advantage of in our programs and uh, get to know, uh, like my friend, Carrie Mendez, who's with us today. Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. Thank you, it's great. It's and great. what I'd like to look at here is, I guess this was your first book you came out with, yeah. of several you have now, and this is a Flower Gardener's Top 10 List. Tell us what those lists are about. This book, I wanted to embrace everything from what are great plants in sun to shade and all different groups of plants, you know, your perennials, annuals, shrubs, uh, small trees. But the other half of this book, I wanted to talk about good, organic, sustainable practices for caring for our gardens. You know, the best ways to water your gardens, how to weed your gardens, um, how to keep Bambi and Thumper, you know, deer and rabbit off your plants. Um, so talking about good garden care practices, working with workhorse plants, and also what to do when in the gardens so that your gardens really are in their best shape year round. I mean, talking about what you do in January, even in different things that would be Time's well, time well spent for So those would be like a list, uh, 10 things exactly. to do in January or whatever. Exactly. Because right, you have 70 lists in here. It looks like, yeah, it sounds like a, a lot, but there's a lot of topics there too to cover. Mm -hmm. And it's not just those plants. It's a garden practice, like you say, as well as plants. And right. I know you have some color photos of plants here, yep. but a lot of it's just like, like you are, like, you know, let's just get right to the chase here and let's, yeah. you know, here are the things to do, you know, yep. and just some real good take home tips, easy to read, and um, so. Um, One so of the things have, I have yeah. to just say, because talking about easy to read, I, oh, I get so many comments about my book, especially this one, that it's so humorous. They just chuckle. I mean, they feel like they're reading something that's fun and laughing as they're reading some of my things about the chipmunks or whatever. And I wanted to spin a lot of humor. We want to have nice gardens. We want to enjoy it. We want to make good choices. Well, I think, you know, that's, that's part of you and, you know, and just having, and like you say, you've got to have fun gardening yeah. and not get too carried away with it or get, get too uptight about it. And also, you are a gardener. You do a lot of this stuff yourself. You have your gardens pictured. Yeah. And so you're writing from real first-hand experience, which I think is very viable. Too. Yeah. I'm a self-taught gardener. I've learned from great people like yourselves and others. I've come up through the, through the ranks with a lot of dirt under the nails and learned from successes well, I think and that's one of the best ways and uh, so thank you so much for sharing all these tips I look forward to looking through a lot of these and I uh, hope the viewers can too and thank you so much for watching today on Across the Fence for University of Vermont Extension I'm Leonard Perry well thanks Leonard the Pringle Herbarium at the University of Vermont is a top 10 place to visit for botanists. Home to a collection of 300,000 specimens of preserved plants, the herbarium tracks the evolution of both flora and fauna. Rebecca Gollin has our story. Wes Testo doesn't have time to stop and smell the flowers. He's too busy collecting them. You ideally want not just leaves, but either flowers or fertile leaves if it's a fern, which I often work with, or fruits, often bark of a tree, something like that. Additional characters that can really help you identify it and would also be useful to someone, you know, 50 or 100 years down the road who come and look at this plant because these specimens, you know, outlast the people who collect them. Testo takes detailed notes about how and where the plant is growing and arranges it in his press. Drying plants as quickly as possible is key to keeping their color and preventing rot. You flatten the whole plant out, um, but you need to do so in a way that presents all of the possible important features of the plant. So you want the flowers to be presented, um, the roots, if you're collecting the roots, to be presented. Um, both sides of leaves, so people can see the undersides and the top sides of leaves. Testo will contribute his findings to one of the largest collections of dried plants in New England, which is located at the University of Vermont. The first person we know about who collected plants, who was connected with the University of Vermont, was a man named Joseph Torrey, who coincidentally also got his name on the building we're in. Dave Barrington is a professor of plant biology at UVM and the curator of the Pringle Herbarium, which is home to over 300,000 specimens of preserved plants. 
and the primary goal of having the collection is to provide a basis for research into biodiversity, conservation of that diversity, and then various studies of what we call systematic biology, which is understanding the kinds of plants and animals, the way they originated through the evolutionary process. While Tori's collection of plants from the 1840s marks the start of the herbarium, what really galvanized the collection was the acquisition of the private herbarium of Charlotte Cyrus Pringle in 1902. And Cyrus is perhaps the most colorful person in the history of the collection. At the time that his collection came to the university, he had in his own house in Charlotte about 50,000 specimens. We're in the fern part of the collection right now, and I open it up, and what I've got here is something like a couple of thousand specimens, each in their folders. The collection here grows through gifts and acquisitions of smaller herbaria as well as trading duplicates of specimens with other institutions. We have some really exotic trading relationships. We have trading relationships with a group in northeastern Brazil, uh, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, uh, a couple of places in Europe. Um, the herbarium in Denmark trades us Greenland specimens, and we trade with herbaria here and there across the United States as well. In addition, the Pringle relies on botany enthusiasts to help grow and round out their collection of local plants. Barrington says those collectors include conservationists and hobbyists, as well as students like Testo, who's working towards a PhD in plant biology. I do a lot of collecting for the herbarium, um, so I started that pretty seriously a little over a year ago when I moved to Vermont. Um, and so I go out in the field quite frequently and collect plants mostly for my own research. So ferns that I am studying, I collect those, um, take a leaf or a whole plant, press it and dry it, um, and deposit those in the herbarium for my own study. But I also am um, broadly interested in the plants that we have here in Vermont. So I collect a lot of those as well, trying to learn to identify them. Herbaria collections not only document the plant life within a geographic area, but also help researchers identify the arrival of invasive species. When you collect a plant, you include the date on when you collected it. For example, Japanese knotweed is a really prominent weed that we have in the state. That wasn't here 50 years ago. Now it's all over our roadsides. Um, so if you go to an herbarium and start to look at collections, you can start to kind of infer when this plant showed up on the scene here. So it looks After the plants dry, Testo will hand them over to the Pringle, um, where they will eventually be mounted. When they are, there's a good chance that it will be done by Hilda White. Newspaper over it. And the plants come sure from all over the world. Plant this plant is from Italy. We have a collector who's collected a lot from Australia and Illinois and everywhere. And we have uh, many Vermont collectors, so our collection of Vermont plants is outstanding. White has and been I'm a volunteer at the Pringle nice since 1998. She's mounted over 30,000 plants for the collection. What is it that makes a good specimen? Well, see this one? It has flowers and roots, and it's pressed nicely so that it, it shows up properly. The, uh, the flowers, the reproductive parts always have to be up so that a scientist that's examining this later can tell what's, what it is. And um, they need to be dried fresh and properly. If they're not dried properly, they come out black instead of green. Like many who volunteer or spend time working at the Pringle, White is also an avid plant collector. Her passion is mosses. Every year I go out to one or two towns and collect mosses. I've gone mostly to towns that have not been recorded very much because we really didn't know whether something was rare or not just because nobody collected it. And, and so for entertainment in the wintertime, I identify these mosses that I, that I collect. Once the specimens are mounted, they're filed into the large cabinets that hold the collection. As those cabinets are organized by botanical family in evolutionary order, 
proper filing is a task that might require a degree in botany just to figure out. So this is one specimen, and this is what we have 300,000 of. Uh, as long as we can keep the insects from eating it and fire from burning it, uh, storage is indefinite. We have specimens in European area that are now 600 years old, and they're fine. You see these plants every day. It's nice to be able to know what the difference is between an oak tree and a maple tree, or between all the different kinds of maples that we have. But you really start to get a grasp for the diversity around you. Um, so instead of just seeing a whole bunch of green around you, you start to see different grasses and plantains and asters and wild impatiens growing. The Pringle Herbarium continues to grow and expand, an old-fashioned catalog of the world around us that remains relevant in our modern times. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. From preserved plants to preserving your face on a piece of toast, Keith Silva brings us to St. Johnsbury and the Vermont Novelty Toaster Corporation. In the 50s, the hip fad was the hula hoop. Pet rocks became a novelty in the 1970s. In recent years, there was a one-time warming trend towards the Snuggie. And now, the selfie toaster? Ah, ooh, that was a hot one. Meet Galen Dively, president and CEO of the Vermont Novelty Toaster Corporation and the inventor of the selfie toaster. It's funny because, I mean, I just came up with the name selfie toaster. And people say it's genius because, you know, selfie is such big now. And I really didn't think about it. But, you know, if I had called it a picture toaster, I don't think it would have taken off the ground because the selfie is, is a big thing now. That's, that's definitely a cultural phenomenon. <laughs> I've always been searching for my pet rock. A few years ago, Dively started making stencils for toasters. Jesus was the first, but before long, Dively wore Buddha, Obama, and I love you into his repertoire. Now for the low, low price of $64, not including shipping, Dively and his team of Toastmasters will put a face on your breakfast. They upload a, a, a photograph if they want. We look at it, make sure it's gonna work okay. And then we take it to our CNC cutting machine and we cut it, cut it out of a 24 gauge sheet of stainless steel. And then we grind that and we test it on our toasters, make sure it looks good. And if it needs any adjustments, I'll go back to draw on board, make the adjustments. If it doesn't, we, uh, we put the inserts in the toasters and ship it off to the customer. The toasters Dively uses are tricked out. In other words, don't try this at home. The toaster itself has these little rails. They're, they're made special for it. Now you, can't, you don't want to put stainless steel down any toaster. You can take them out, but please uh, make sure that the, your, uh, they've cooled down and, you know, for extra safety, unplug it. <laughs> Novelty or not, there is an art to making a good impression. What you're looking for is some, a fine grain bread to get the best picture on the, on, the, on the toast. Some breads have a lot of holes in them, and when you're doing a selfie toaster and you got a lot of detail in it, it doesn't come out as nice. Some designs, like the paw print, or they'll come out on any toast. Whereas some of the selfie, because you got little lines and you got a little finer detail, if those lines go over a hole, it's not going to be there. So it doesn't come out as, 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 as good as if it was a fine grain bread. All kidding aside, Dively employs five people and has a warehouse full of toasters. When it comes to making bread, Dively is all business. Yeah, it is serious. I mean, it's a business. Uh, and my wife reminds me that every day. <laughs> every year we've doubled our production and doubled what we've been doing. We had the best third quarter ever last, this last third quarter. And this fourth quarter is looking like our best fourth quarter ever. And it's Christmas time. And it's just, and next year, oh, we'll have our selfie toasters in stores where people can buy the toaster and there'll be a code in the toaster that they go to our website, upload their picture, put the code in and we'll send them the inserts. So as, and as soon as we expand to actual where stores are, are selling them, then uh, the next year is probably gonna be, I mean, we're hoping to grow another two, 300, 400% by next year. Bads come and go, and that's kind of the point. 
One thing that's never out of fashion is a good idea. Even better is a good idea that makes money. You know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I had a whole bunch of toasters in the back part of the warehouse there that wasn't quite selling quick enough, so I had to come up with some idea to sell them quicker. <laughs> that's, that was my idea. Simple as that. <laughs> So the next time you have an idea that pops into your head, take Dively's advice. Or better yet, take a selfie. In St. Johnsbury, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, you never know what's going to pop up on this show. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.